My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is Monday, August 27th, and I'm in Peabody, Kansas, interviewing Gary and Marilyn Jones as part of the O State Stories Oral History Project. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Well, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, Gary, if you could start for us, please, and tell us the year you were born and where you were born. Well, actually, we were both born the same year, 1933, back in another eon, you know. And we graduated from Dexter, Kansas, which is right, <coughs> right down on the border of, it's in Cali County, on the border of Oklahoma. And we, we were the only two that go to college out of this class. And then also, at that time, to be married and go to school, that was a no-no. But we, we got married on the 2nd and uh, moved to Stillwater on the 7th of September to start school. And I, I was in agri agriculture and she was in home economics. And so. And what did your parents do for a living? Well, my, my dad was a farmer and also ran, he ran a locker plant and a, a grocery store. And uh, her, her dad was a full-time farmer south of Dexter. At that point, when I was little, he worked for the Canatex refinery out of North Kansas City, which was closed down, and then he went out to Colorado after they closed that. So I had one sister, and we lived with my grandparents just around the corner. Uh, but we lived, lived there when I was in first grade, at least, and up till I'm not sure when he moved out, about the third or fourth grade. Because I always went to country school, he always lived in town. Mm -hmm. But I went to country school and there were three years where there were just two of us, me and one other one. <laughs> and that's where I think I learned to speed read. I'm not reading, but I really read really fast. <laughs> that's my library stack for the week above your head up there. But, wow. <laughs> for the well, week. Yeah. Well, that's, they're not very heavy reading. Though, for sure. I guess the, may, maybe the reason we went to Oklahoma a and at that time was uh, we had <clears throat> we had a young basketball coach that had just that had just graduated from down there, and uh, he got to taking the the basketball team down there to Stillwater in my junior and senior year to basketball games, and so we kind of got acquainted with the the campus, and nobody ever took us to K State, so so we went to Oklahoma State instead, and I. I a tribute to him taking us down there and getting us acquainted with it, and uh, he would he would take the whole basketball team down there to take in basketball games with Hank Iba and all that. Was education uh, something that was uh, important in your family to encourage it you? It was in mine. My mom graduated in the very first class from our Kansas City JUCO, and my dad went one year to Phillips University, which in that era. Most people didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. ne neither one of my parents, they just graduated high school and that's it. And neither one of our sets of parents didn't think it would work. But uh, I guess it did. <laughs> well, how did you two meet? In high school. In high school? Well, I knew him before that because his dad used to drive <laughs> a standard oil truck and deliver oil out in the country. That's when I was a little guy. <laughs> he was a pest. <laughs> One time in high school, I was up changing the clock so we would get out of school early. And, uh, you know, and then he hollered cheese at the cops and got me in all kinds of trouble. <laughs> we weren't perfect students in but, high school. But we went, I went one year to Winfield High School because my parents thought that was a better education in Winfield. And, and I hated it. But I read every book in the Winfield Library, I think, almost. But then I went to Dexter. It was a much smaller to me, friendlier place, but it's just probably because of the number of people. There was a whole sum of 18 in our graduating <clears throat> class. Uh, not, not too many more than that in the whole school. <laughs> we, we had chances to go to a private school at Winfield. They, they offered us a scholarship, but they didn't have any agriculture, and I was, I thought I wanted to go into agriculture. Uh, and so we, we didn't partake of that one. We went down to Oklahoma State instead. <clears throat> and had to work all the time because 
uh, our parents, they, they couldn't or wouldn't help us any. Mm -hmm. well, they'd help well, us they a, little, <laughs> a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, we worked in various jobs at Oklahoma State. In fact, uh, when we flew into Vest Village on the 7th, we, for somehow, I, I, I can't remember how we got there, all the details, but we landed up out there. Uh, of course, at that time, they didn't have any married student. The only thing they had for married students was out there because uh, married students just didn't go to school at that time in, in 1951. But uh, it, I, I, I went up to the to the post office to you know get a box or because we all had to have boxes there. The post office was in a Quonset building like you showed there, and I, I noticed up on the bulletin board that they wanted a butcher at the commissary. Now they had a commissary, a pretty good size one there in Vest Village for the veterans, but they anyway they had a sign up where they wanted a butcher. Well, at my junior and senior high school, I, I worked as a butcher in my dad's locker plant. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'll, I was looking for a job anyway, so I ventured over and they, they jumped on me. And, and at that time, I got a, an extra 15 cents an hour for being a trained butcher. I got 65 cents an hour. I, I got th 50 cents an hour. I thought that was big money, you know. And so they, they would, uh, we worked out a deal where I would fill the meat case of a morning and I wouldn't have any classes until 10 o'clock. So I would go over there early, fill the meat case uh, and the, the meat in the meat case and then go to class at 10 o'clock. She, she worked for a lady in home ec doing experimental uh, different things they worked on. Uh, sweet potato stuff and apple stuff, but they, they would make uh, recipes and make new recipes. Mostly I just typed. <laughs> I mean, we did a lot of food stuff, but then type up and the recipes and so forth. But that time, 65 cents an hour was... That was good money. Oh, yeah. And if she hadn't hired me, and she hired, she didn't hire me out of the Oklahoma State budget, she hired me out of her own... She only, she only got 50 cents. She was an old maid lady. I never, we always... She had an investment, and when she died, she even left me $8,000 when she died, and she came here at the nursing home and planned to work as a dietitian at the nursing home. But and she never got married, she never had any family, and the last few years she didn't know up from down or anything. But how she made it, I, I have never known, because wages at that time for a single, even a college instructor were not good, you know, they were terrible. What was her name? Eula Morris. Hmm. And Yes. But if it hadn't been for her, we probably wouldn't have gotten through. And junior and senior year, they, well, they, they closed the commissary down because uh, the best village, the population was dwindling and uh, Safeway and that was bigger downtown. So they closed it down, so I was without a job. Uh, I went to work in the audiovisual department uh, under name, a guy's name of Guy Pritchard. And, uh, of course, their audiovisual department consists mostly of 16 millimeter movie uh, machines, and I would take them around to a different classroom and show these movies. They were they would have different educational movies, and uh, at night uh, the sororities and fraternities would would uh, rent out a machine, and I would go show a movie there a lot. They, they found out I was married and they said, well, good, you you can show the childbirth movie and <laughs> and some of the ones that... Uh, X-rated stuff. <laughs> X-rated, you know. So I got this job. I, I got a, a little extra money for hauling all the equipment around in my pickup uh, to the sorority and fraternity houses at night. But then anyway, uh, also uh, during weekends, I would work for Miss Morris too because she always had things that need to be repaired or fixed or whatever around her house. Or out in the yard. So she, she helped us quite a bit then. Yeah. 
but uh, that that kept us alive, I guess. <laughs> well, tell me, tell me a little bit more about that village and what your living accommodations were like. Okay. I drew a sketch here. <clears throat> It's 16 by 16, it's just like this picture I don't know whether here. this will, will pick it up or not, mm -hmm. but, but. Uh, this was the house and it was 16 by 16, and as you can see it was very plain. Uh, they moved them in. They weren't prefab, but they were all made out of plywood. Uh, the walls were a quarter inch thick. And, uh, well, I'd call them prefab. They were, well, they pretty well. slapped but, them up there. <laughs> but it was real compact in there because uh, it, it worked out pretty good. The, the bathroom was small, you walked in and backed out. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it was uh, completely furnished. It had, uh, you know, a stove. We had to furnish it. I think maybe, I think maybe the stove was in it. I don't it know. Was, it was, but we it had was, buy a refrigerator. At least it had uh, natural gas, so we had a gas cook stove. We had to buy our own food refrigerator, and so we bought a small refrigerator. And uh, she had an old treadle sewing machine. We brought in a, a one of us would study off. That was a, one of the desks, and I always studied off the kitchen table, which was a small porcelain table. Fact, Actually, we, we still have that. Still table. got it over <laughs> in the barn. <laughs> We've never used it here, but we still have it. But uh, and I, we had a radio, and one of the few at that it, point. It was an FM radio. <laughs> at that point, they had so many students, and the the stadium wasn't the stadium. The round field house was very small, and so only half of the students got to go. So then, if you were the half that didn't get to go, you could usually swap somebody for a ticket. But they'd come. A lot of people would come to our house, and we'd all gather around the radio to. Listen, Lynn said to be sure and tell you this, I was brought up on radio. My dad always listened to St. Louis Cardinals and the Brooklyn Dodgers and that area. And she found, when we were hunting for this stuff, my eighth grade graduation speech, which I gave and said one of the things I was busy doing was listening to ball games. I thought that was funny. Because then we listened to ball games. But on Saturday morning, I would clean the house and, and we had Jack Armstrong, the All-American boy, Sergeant President of the Yukon, the Green Hornet and the villain was the praying mantis I remember him. Yeah. Seemed like there was one other one, but that was our Saturday, my Saturday morning. The, the nice part, of, part about it was everybody out there was in the same boat. They were poor. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they were in school, yes, but they didn't have much money to spend other than going to school. And so they, they would come over uh, to, for ball games because we had the only FM. I think we got it for maybe our wedding gift or something. I don't know. But uh, we, uh, when they have a ball game on, and then also at, uh, we could only go to half basketball games. We could go to all the football. Games. No, it's yeah, it was all the football games. But at that time, the Oklahoma State football team was so bad, <laughs> everybody beat them. But the basketball team was opposite under Hank Iba mm -hmm. was so good. And then also somebody got us going to the wrestling matches. At that time they had a national winning team. And so we, we got, uh, and they let all the students that wanted to, to go to wrestling matches because they didn't have that many at the game. And so we, we got to be quite uh, the wrestling fans too because they had an extra good team. Let's see what else. I, we, we had a pickup that my dad loaned us a pickup to go to school, and uh, we we couldn't go home very often because we we couldn't afford to buy the gas to come back up to Dexter. So we we'd come home on Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter, and that's about it. Uh, at that time, my my folks was was still in the locker plant. And, uh, and we'd come home, they'd give us a, a box of meat to help us along. And we, we got so tired of just eating beef that we would trade the steaks sometimes for bologna. <laughs> Some of the neighbors had bologna, we'd trade them steaks for that bologna because 
we, we just got tired of beef you know, all the time. And that'd give you a variety of things. The, we had a garden back behind the house. Yeah, we had a garden right behind the house because we had a swamp cooler in this back window back here. What's a swamp cooler? <laughs> It, it's, evaporative cooler, yeah. and you ran water over it. Run water through it. Like a, let's see, what's comparable? To, well, it's it's actually like the filter in present day air conditioners, but you ran water over it, and we didn't have any recycling mechanism, obviously, so all the water We just, run it out on the garden. Oh, okay. We had a lovely mint patch, and my homemade teachers were always so impressed that I could bring mint to garnish things. <laughs> <laughs> but then I, I, continue, I worked there for the commissary for two years under. Uh, E.M. Austin, we call him Emo. That was his initials, you know. And he he, he was a nice old guy, and, and he was jolly to work with. His wife was a little bit nuts, but that, that's all right. We we got along. We had a clothesline back there by the garden, but one year we had such a good cantaloupe crop, and I was taking him around and giving him to neighbors, and that some people thought I was selling them. <laughs> they didn't want any, but I was just giving them away. <laughs> we had so many of them. <laughs> But other people have gardens around? Uh, I not, don't think not so. Not too many. I, don't re I tried to remember if anybody did. I couldn't think of anybody. But we've always gardened. We always had. And uh, one year I took, I took uh, horticulture one, under Frank Lacroon. And uh, one of the requirements there was you had to develop a vegetable garden. And so we had a vegetable garden there. It was down there right behind the. Probably the old infirmary is probably not there anymore. Uh, but anyway, they, there was uh, some patches right behind that where we, we were were allowed to develop a garden. And then we got graded on the garden. I didn't get graded too high because a few weeds got in it. That's a problem today. <laughs> <laughs> One th that was, the, I guess, our only social life was we did belong to the horticulture club and we yeah. learned to make cider. We blew some up in the closet one time. <laughs> they, <laughs> they probably still make cider for a money making thing, don't they? Or do they? I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, but that's something we do to this day. If we have apples, we still make apples. Yeah, we have our own cider uh, <laughs> press and things. But uh, the horticulture club, they, they got the apples from the from the school farm and, and made it was cider, a money, it was cider a money making that, thing for them. And then they, they sold it at uh, homecoming football games. Hmm. And one of the things that we did in the foods lab was develop things to do with apples. And one of them was making cider floats, which is nothing but cider with vanilla ice cream in it and a dash of nutmeg on the top. But it's really good. And hmm. I don't know of anybody else that makes them, <laughs> but it is good. Well, you, you mentioned the, the commissary in Vet Village. What, what were some of the other things Vet Village had that the rest of the campus did not? Well, we had, laundry. And we had our own post office. Uh, all these were in Quonset buildings. And then also, just just to the east of our house was, was the Vet Village Gymnasium. It was just a big old building that had a basketball court in there. And you go down there and play basketball. I never had time to play basketball. But anyway, they, they did. And, and I, I think that's about all the... I don't think they had any other... That's about all they had. If you wanted to shop, or you could shop, you had to go downtown to Stillwater. But the one summer, Gary had to go to officer's training at Fort Benning, Georgia. And ROTC. So so he took the vehicle, so if I needed to go something, you know, I walked to town, which was like five miles, so he didn't, he didn't walk very often. <laughs> but, you know, the campus wasn't that far away, basically. I but you had to get across the campus to get clear on downtown still. Mm -hmm. Was it, were you able to make friends in Vet Village even though you weren't veterans? Oh, yeah. Well. Let's see, there, there was... Two couples that we visit a lot with, one right next to yeah, us. And they, they were non-veterans, too. Mm -hmm. Well, both of them were, and then the other one... Across the street. Lived he was, across the street. He was a uh, poultry major, which there weren't that many of poultry majors then, so... Uh, he, he was originally from 
Massachusetts. In fact, both of them were from Massachusetts. And uh, let's see what she 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 worked and she was an artist. She and he went to school. And, and uh, she supported them. Yeah. But we we didn't. Well, there was a there was a few other people. Well, I remember Pete and Merrily, they, they were older. They were from back east, too. Uh, we got, you know, they were weekend friends or something like that. But really didn't have time to visit. No, you didn't have time to do too you much visiting. Work to stay alive. <laughs> work and go to school. Uh, we this is the ball game. Yeah. We, both, we, we both carried about 15 to 17 hours a semester, uh, plus working full time. Mm -hmm. So it kept you pretty busy, and so you didn't have a lot of social time. <laughs> Did you live in Vet Village your whole time on All campus? All four years. Mm -hmm. They they would let us let us keep the the place. I I don't remember whether whether we had to pay rent or not. The rent was thirty dollars a month, mm -hmm. and so. <clears throat> I, I was in ROTC all four years. Well, the first two years you were required to be in ROTC. I don't think they are now. Oh. But then uh, the, the draft was hot on my heels because I was in the Air Force or Air Force first two years ROTC. Well, we've got up to go to advanced ROTC, and you had to have 2020 vision without glasses. Well, I did. Because they said you had to have that to fly. Well, I didn't want to fly anyway. And so I went over, uh, well, the, the draft board sent me notice that you will be drafted. And so I, I went across the street to the Army ROTC, and they were glad to have you. And so I got into advanced ROTC. This helped a great deal because I got $29 a month then from ROTC. Well, that lacked a dollar paying the rent, mm -hmm. and it helped us survive. Pretty well. You know, once we started to get an extra twenty-nine months, we thought we were heaven. You know. <laughs> but uh, let's see. The the last year, last uh, maybe junior year, I worked in Cymex law uh, Cymex locker plant. Uh, it's not there anymore. In fact, we went by there and there's. They, they tore the whole thing down, but the Cymex had a locker plant, and also they made ice. And so I, I worked there for, uh, I would, uh, had a job there of an evening, evening and Saturday. I, I went in to clean up the saws and all the equipment. And then Saturday I worked as a, as a meat cutter then. We were, we were there in the days of segregation, so. Yeah. Uh, I worked at the hotel and the Boston Pops Orchestra came through and that was Paul Robeson sang with him and he could stay there on campus but he couldn't stay downtown in a hotel with, because he was black and couldn't use the fountain and all that sort of thing. But you worked at I, the Atherton? Or? It's what it is now I think. Yeah. Okay. But it was just at that point. The Student it Union was the Hotel? Student Union hotel. Yeah. And it was relatively new then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In yeah. fact, uh, we went went back and stayed in here just a year or so ago. Uh, and when our grandson graduated high school, he, he graduated from Perkins High School, mm -hmm. and it was 50 years ago to the year that she was uh, a clerk in the hotel. Of, well, it wasn't called Atherton then. Mm -hmm. It was an for uh, Atherton somebody that left money, I think. Mm -hmm. It was it was just the hotel at the student union at, at that point. But I finished at midterm and he still had time to go and then he had summer school that one year. Oh the kind of took our DC that took a lot of my took hours. his time out of there. Well the the student union back then was, you know, the Waldorf Astoria oh, it was. student yeah. unions. Right, right. Well tell me about the the hotel. What was it like? She as far she as didn't I was get in already. She worked a desk. As far as I was going it you know, it was a really good job. Mm -hmm. But that's other than working there, I, I don't. It was just a job, I guess the yeah. things I think about nowadays would never, they wouldn't happen today because a lot of it had to do with whether you were black or white. Right. You know, and you didn't have black students on campus either. The only time I did, and I in graduate school, they could be black, 
And so one summer I went to summer school and he was gone and I had this wonderful lady who she said, Oh Lord, honey, you don't think I let my husband see me, do you? And she would get in the closet to get dressed or she was a whole back teacher from I don't remember where, from somewhere, but I had some really wonderful experiences with people that otherwise you couldn't talk to. Mm -hmm. At that time they all they all went to Langston. Right. Now now they even the whites can go to Langston. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Langston supposedly has a really good goat. The best goat part that right. I would like to go <laughs> visit. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> we'll have to take you out and show you our goats out here. That'd be awesome. <laughs> well, was it? Did you find it challenging being married students? We we, we didn't, didn't know, know any difference. <laughs> we we were both eighteen. Mm -hmm. I, sh I think I should say, I was out in the country, and we didn't have electricity or water or any of, or even good roads that you mm -hmm. could go on. If it rained, we had a car, but you didn't go on, you know, on that kind of road. And we didn't have a telephone, or his folks had the first TV in the country, but I don't know whether that was good or bad, but it's so different than anybody today, where he always had conveniences, <laughs> at least. But I, I think that sort of shaped the way we grew up. We weren't expecting a lot. Mm -hmm. And as we look so back... So it wasn't we, so bad not to have it because you didn't know any different. Yeah, right? so we, you look back and we were quite fugal, I guess. Mm -hmm. My sister was sick a lot before penicillin came along. She had a lot of earaches and the Missouri Pacific Railroad track went really close, about as far as from here out to the road. So if they would take her to Arkansas City to the doctor, mom would go out and flag the train down and get on the train and you could go in in the morning at 10 o'clock and come back in the afternoon at 2. But the roads were so bad you didn't drive it if it turned out that way. But, but lots have changed since 1951, you know. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that long ago. But. Well, do you have any teachers that really stand out in your mind? Yeah, I do. The the lady I worked for, although she was never my teacher, but I saw her teaching. And then had a, another lady. Well, Dean O'Toole was the dean of home economics, and but oh, I can't think of the lady's name. Miss McAllister, she was an old battle axe. She <laughs> told me that we had to live in the home management house for six weeks, and she told me you couldn't eat cold wieners. You yeah, had to eat cook, cook wieners. <laughs> I remember that so plainly. <laughs> But there was another lady whose name I cannot remember, and she was the one that encouraged me. She kept saying, you're hiding your light under a bushel basket, you could go out and do, be it. I was so timid I couldn't talk, obviously now I won't shut up, but she said you could give speeches and that sort of thing if you would just do it. But I had, had to take a speech class, and I remember this was a man. And he said, are you physically deformed that you can't open your mouth? <laughs> I was so scared I couldn't. But she, the lady, really encouraged me a lot. Right, her name was Right. I can't think of her first name. Was. I don't. I don't remember. There's some of them I remember, but their names have slipped me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do remember J. C. Hilliard. He was the swine instructor. They always called him Hog Hilliard. Uh, let's see, who was the meat man? I don't know, but I remember taking a psychology class in Old Central, and somebody went to sleep, and the professor threw up. Race around and hit him right square in the face. <laughs> yeah, we can't get away with that today. Ain't <laughs> throwing you in jail. It was, it was very effective. <laughs> yeah, they, they had a, a shot plan. I got, I got into agriculture education about my junior and senior year, and I had to take a, a well, altogether different classes, you know. And one of them was a shot class. And I, I, st I still remember the instructor, but I can't recall his name. And he he kind of felt sorry for me. He'd give me Saturday jobs to come in and clean up the shop because he he at the time he lived in Beth Village too, even though he was instructor. And he'd give me jobs to so I could make a make a few bucks. Doctor Norton was a dairy professor. We he, were he just talking about good. him yesterday, and he went to K State. Well, at least after he was there, and we knew him at K State, and he was just a really nice guy. That taught a lot about cheese and that sort of stuff. Fred, Fred, Lacour, 
Fred Lacrone was the horticulture instructor, and he he moved up to I'd be it, uh, I think, the assistant dean or something like that later on. When we first came here, he was, I was when I took first classes, you know. I, I got kind of interested in horticulture along with my agriculture education classes. And for some reason, I took about as many. I, I didn't, didn't care too much for the shop part, but I was interested in horticulture. And I remember I took commercial vegetables and gee, I don't remember what else, but uh, Fred Lacrone still sticks it in my mind. I like to take horticulture because it's an easy way to get an A. <laughs> oh yeah, it was put. My grandma always gardened and I, I guess we always gardened. In fact, it even carried over when I went to teach it in Peabody. I started the, the first horticulture department in the state. I mean, the first horticulture classes. Now they've got a full-time teacher up there with a greenhouse and a whole bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think just because I was interested in horticulture and not and interested in fixing engines and that kind of stuff. Well, Marilyn, you mentioned the practice house. Uh, home management house. The home management oh. house. Can you tell me where it was located on campus? No, I can't. Okay. It was out at the edge, and it was just a regular house. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to learn to dust with two hands, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and I could look at dust and not even see it today. But, uh, what were some of the other things you, you had to do in the house? How did it well, work? There were, I forgot, there were like six of us maybe that had to live out there. And we had to, you know, have regular meals and learn to make the bed just so-so. Have the meals and serving courses, that type of thing, which was totally different than what I was brought up doing in my <laughs> relatively poor environment. There, you know, it was all different to me. But I did learn to make a bed. So you turn the top, you know, we have a bed and breakfast down there. To this day, I make a bed, turn the top sheet over like that, <laughs> which that was one thing you had to do: dusting the two hands and being sure to cook the wieners. I remember that. <laughs> The lady was uh, an old maid lady, and oh, she she was, she was very she was strict. Yeah, you know. we just laughed about very her. Very particular. But the lady that I said the foods lady that I said I made such an there were certain things. Well, Miss McAllister, the whole management lady, she wanted you to you know you should be able to make biscuits and muffins and a simple cake without a recipe. You know, you know, certain things that you just should know. That's all it was to it. I had to go out student teaching course, uh, uh, what, senior year. At that time you had to spend, uh, well, we, we only spent six weeks out student teaching, and they always sent two out. I mean, you went out in pairs, and there was a reason for that, uh, because one of them would teach and the other one would critique the other one, and worked out real well. I, I happened to draw my, my partner that went with me. He was from uh, way, way down in southeast Oklahoma and he was a coon hunter and that was his that was his uh, his pastime. All he could talk about was running coons with his coon dogs. It, he, he was really quite a character but uh, we, we kind of thought alike and and student teaching, so we worked out very well. And also, we would we would try to protect each other when uh, Doctor Orr come out to check us. You know, uh, we would get the wind that he's coming out, so we would work together. So uh, we covered each other's back when he come out. In. But uh, the the pra the practice teacher that was there. He, he was kind of a show bum, and he was gone all the time looking for steers and pigs and everything else. Uh, we, we were expected to do that too, and also he was busy with show animals or there's different shows. It was in the spring, but when they had spring shows, and we were gone all the time, and so we, we didn't get to teach very much, and we found out that I think Dr. White was coming out. 
uh, he, he was a quick big old guy, but he was jolly. And we, we, we kind of cooked up a lesson that we was going to teach because we'd been out scrubbing calves and pigs and everything else during school time. And we weren't teaching any, but we had to teach them when they come out. They, they didn't want to see us scrubbing pigs. And so we, we dreamed up some, some class to satisfy him, you know. And he, he was pretty upset that we hadn't been teaching, you know, in the class all the time. He said, I'm thinking about transferring you guys to another, another location. Oh, no, we, we really like it here. <laughs> and we convinced him to leave us alone. Well, that didn't work that way. I, I was able to practice teacher right there in Stillwater, and we had to teach for a whole semester. Although I remember going over to Pahuska and observing at one point. Uh, that was Osage Indian country over there, and again, it was this segregation thing. The Indians, if you were an Osage, you had a lot of money probably, but if you were a Ponca, and we went right by the Ponca on our way, if we came back to Kansas, they had absolutely nothing. But, but the Ponca Indians over there, they were, it was good to be a Ponca, I mean, not a Ponca, an Osage over there. They had oil money. Mm -hmm. They had money, and they were on campus quite a bit driving big cars and so forth. Yeah, I remember we, in agriculture, we had, uh, we had a, uh, an Indian girl in class. Her, her mother would bring her to school every morning in a big, long Buick. We used to kind of chuckle about it. Fanny, Fanny Bear Track. Wasn't Fanny Bear Track. <laughs> I hadn't thought about her for a long time. She, she was a good student, but mom brought her ever to school every morning, uh, to class anyway. In a big old long Buick. <laughs> of course, today I think your car tag says Native American or something. Right, like that. right. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. You know. But that time, you, if you were an Indian, you weren't very high on the social schedule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now they. We had to learn the five civilized tribes because we hadn't had Oklahoma history to get a teaching certificate. I used to know. I don't know that I do anymore. One of the questions was, uh, in what county is the highest elevation? They had some dumb questions on there, <laughs> really. But I, it was a standard test, you know, for, you had to have it for Oklahoma history. You know. I had to have an hour of swimming. I made it around the pool without drowning, so I passed. <laughs> and the old, uh, was it in the old armory building? The, uh, I can't remember where it was. Had kind of a track on the top, maybe? That I yeah. don't that, That's where the swimming pool was at. Yeah, yeah that she, had to t mm -hmm. she had to swim across the swimming pool. No, I had to go clear around it. <laughs> I, I didn't have to take all those classes because I was in ROTC and that took care of it. Yeah. I didn't have to take math or I probably never would have graduated. I had to take art and that was kind of fun. But those were just requirements that you had to have for a teaching certificate. It, I can't say they contributed to your education particularly, but, but you had to have them. So were you thinking that you, you both wanted to become teachers? Nope, never heard of it. I just wanted, you know, if I had a family to be able to support them. I didn't particularly want to teach, but I wanted something to fall back on if I had to. The, the first year, first two years I was in general agriculture, just took ag classes. Uh, but then I got to looking around at what am I, where am I going to go, you know, how am I going to make a living? There was no farm to go back to at home. And at that time, you, uh, you could get a, a farmhand job, but that was, you know, nothing. And so I got thinking, well, I've got to do something. But somehow somebody convinced me to go into ag education. And said, go to ag education, and also you can, you can run the FFA program. Well, I didn't know what the FFA program was, but we didn't have an FFA in the little school I came from. But I got kind of interested in it and, uh, got, and went into ag education. And it, that's where I stayed the rest of my life, I guess. <clears throat> I remember Dr. Orr was there. We called him Pappy Orr. Not to his face, but he, he was a little short-statured man, gray-haired, I still remember him. And you'd go in to see him and he, 
and he, he kind of looked, what do you want? <laughs> he felt like he was just going to eat you alive. And I, I, I remember I went in and talked to him one time. And, what do you want? I said, well, have you got time to visit a little bit? Sure, I've got time. <laughs> That's just kind of the way he was. But then Dr. White, he was a, a real big, jolly man. And he was nice to visit with. But Dr. O was the head of the department, so he's the one you had to talk to. At that time, it was, it was upstairs in Whitehair. Whitehair? Whitehurst. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where it was, uh, the agate department. Okay. But, but uh, I, I graduated here again, the ROTC threw me behind. I had to go to summer school, my last summer school, uh, to, to get out, you know. And so, I, I, I thought, well, I'll, we'll just go right into the Army once, once I graduated. No problem. Well, the, your orders come out that, uh, oh, in the middle of August, which, boom, you know. Uh, they didn't want me until 1st of December. Well, you know, I had to go from August to 1st of December. I had to eat. And so they... Dr. Orr said, oh, go ahead and get your job. They'll, they'll defer you, no problem. Well, where you go find a teaching job on the last of August? So he he looked at his file and said, well, I've got I've got three here in the vehicle, which that, that was a lot of openings, you know. One of them was in, in Candace, Leon, Candace. I thought, that, that's too close to home. I don't want to start teaching right close to home. He said, I've got two in Illinois. Well, I, I said, well, I used to have an uncle live in Illinois and always liked the country. I'd like to go up there and, you know, investigate. So he, he stuck my transcript in an envelope and 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 that that was my, that's it. <laughs> and I was on the road looking for a job and uh, in, in Illinois. And we went to the first one and the old superintendent had been the wrestling coach in uh, uh, Tech High School in Indianapolis for, for years, but he finally got his administrator certificate. And so he had taken this job as superintendent in this little town of Allendale, Illinois, which population of 300 at the most. Uh, but anyway, we, we cycle in there, and lo and behold, he was from Mulvane, Kansas originally. And he found out we were originally from Kansas, and, and he, he took to us like a a father, you know. Just, and really, and he hired us, hired me too. Started out at forty two hundred for eleven months, and so I stayed there a year because I knew I had to had to go uh, take care of my old TC duty. And uh, sure enough, it come up the first of, of December and I was supposed to go and I was middle school see he said what am I going to do for an egg teacher and I said I don't know he, I said they, I said well they kind of promised me that they would defer me, me going in until in the school and he said well who's that guy on there there's some captain that wrote out these orders he picked up the telephone called him he chewed on him unmercifully and when he got down chewing him this captain said well, when would he like to go to <laughs> come on to the <laughs> So yeah, he got me deferred then until the till the end of the year. Well, it was in November, and I still had the same problem. You know, there was a gap in there. Mm. But this is where I found a job then, uh, detasseling corn. That's the only place I was ever homesick for. The people were so friendly and so nice to us. Well, we found Actually, Mike was born in Illinois. We found a little little place at the edge of town that, uh, you know, you weren't in town. Mm -hmm. And the guy that owned the place had a bunch of goats out there. He took care of his goats. He, he hired me to take care of it, to feed his goats. And so it was it was kind of like this place is out at the edge of town. And I, I, then I got a job detasseling corn. And once we got done detasseling corn, I, I went into the where we took the corn and I was 
charge of the corn dryer then for Jacob Seed Corn Company. And I worked for them until December when I went to Fort Benning, Georgia then. Illinois was so different than Kansas. I mean, there were trees, you know, it was green everywhere. And here, it's not true anymore so much. But if there's trees, you think there's a creek there, there's some water there. Well, in Illinois, of course, there was stuff everywhere. It rained every week. Had this wonderful lady that lived next to us. She was a grandmother type. And she'd say, now don't worry, when you get tired of blackberries, there'll be something else coming on. And she taught, she taught us how to find morel mushrooms. And she was just a dear, dear lady. We, we were just way out there in, in Illinois on her own. But they made us so welcome. It was, it was a wonderful we, place. To we live. lived on this, they called it the square. It was a mile square. There were people lived around. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they said, oh yeah, I said, you know, they, they didn't take the strangers too well. Said, yeah, there's some newcomers right down the road there. How long they've been there? Uh, they've been there 25 years. They were still newcomers. <laughs> I thought it was 40 years. <laughs> but they, they took care of us just like we were, had always been there. And until just, say, the past 10 years, we've kept in touch with yeah, we've, quite a few. Of even them. the old superintendent, I used to call him all the time. <laughs> he Once came by and stayed with us one time. So you ended up in Fort Benning. Yeah, I had to go through officer Briefly. training. <laughs> had to go through officer's training at uh -huh. Fort Benning. Used to call it Fort Benning School for Boys. Mm -hmm. And then the, the Korean War was winding down, and they, but they were still sending a lot of uh, green second lieutenants to Korea. Well, they, they come around and said, who, who wants to volunteer for uh, ranger and also a jump school. Uh, <laughs> this guy, but uh, some of the guys said, "Oh, boy, said you sign up for those, and you won't have to go to Korea." Well, uh, you know, I said, "I'm not, I'm not signing up for anything." And it, and there was a bunch of us that didn't sign up for anything. Well, once we got done with school, all the ones that signed up for Ranger Airborne went straight to Korea. Wow. The rest of us, they they sent us to Fort Jackson and. Uh, South Carolina and also Fort Bliss in North Carolina to, to uh, take recruits through basic training. Uh, I, I went through basic training eight times. You know. <laughs> what are you doing all this? During all this, what are you doing, Marilyn? She was well, tagging along. Mike was born the first year we taught school. Mm -hmm. We have two kids and so and I've never... I was so far out in the country, there's your public calling. <clears throat> I'd never taken care of a baby in my whole life. Or, you know, babysitting wasn't anything I'd ever done, and that was a big chore as far as I was concerned. But as I said, I'd never been around any babies, so taking care of Mike was just a, a major, major thing. But again, the very, the very same thing that I guess is always the nice thing was the South was really segregated, mm -hmm. and Gary's commanding officer was black, and we had really nice neighbors on both sides. We lived out in the community. In they, great town. They said, fun. don't you ever bring anybody out here like that. And no. I mean, we could have been real good friends, but that wasn't the way the world, and that's the We said to be good friends on post. The only place I ever saw the Ku Klux Klan was. <laughs> Not we, good. We had, uh, Mike, our son was just a baby down there in, in South Carolina. Also, we had an English bulldog. She was pretty good size, and she she used to sit in the, in the front door. I mean, in, behind the screen, and just sat there. You know, that's why I swear she liked to sit. The neighbors across the street thought we had a really informed, uh, deformed baby, because <laughs> that bulldog would just sit there, you know, in the sun. But but it was pretty country. It was so again, it was so different because they had things that don't grow here either, like mm -hmm. flowers that grow there, azaleas and chameleons it, and that it sort rained of thing. 14 days straight. And so we day. got to see different country, visit some plantations and as far as that, and of course the money was good. From our standpoint, it's the most we'd ever had in our whole lives. And, mm -hmm. and we hated it. <sighs> Could not count the days till we got out of it. Uh, we, we hated it every day. But uh, oh, the, the most of most of the ones that, that I worked for out on post, they, 
they were real nice, and, and at this time, Mike could just kind of walk a little bit. And uh, take him out there to get a haircut, because we had a, a barber in their company, and he, he cut his hair for a quarter. And so I, I take him out there all the time. Uh, we got pretty close to to the cadres there, because the troops would come and go every, every eight weeks, if that's how long we'd have. But the pay was good, and we shopped, yeah, we, we shopped at the commissary on base. And I, I was paid $222 a month, we thought. Man, that's a lot of money. <laughs> some, some hurricane came along. I can't remember which one it was, but Gary had a, a sergeant. Remember the front of Puerto Rico? Yep. Well, anyhow, I'd taken Mike out to the base. I don't remember why I had, but right in front of me, the pine trees were just snapping off, you know, like this. And this man knew what it was, a hurricane, but no, I didn't know. The Sergeant rest Martinez. The rest of the world didn't know what he was trying to warn him, but he couldn't remember any English, so all he was telling he, was in Spanish. Yeah, he, he couldn't talk English too well, you know. And when he'd get excited, he couldn't talk English at all. <laughs> Nothing actually happened. And he was just running around there to going nuts, you know, because he'd hurt him. All he could get out of him was a hurricane. We were sure not where we were supposed and to be. So those trees were just going right mm -hmm. down. Yeah, I often wonder whatever happened to that old that old sergeant was a real good old boy. When you're when you're in the service, are you thinking about what's going to happen after you leave? After oh, you yeah. Are, yeah, we oh, can yeah. hardly wait to get out. What of it. what what were you thinking? What was going to be next? Well, uh, finding a teaching job to make a living. <laughs> I I was on guard duty one night, and on guard duty, all the, you're required to stay awake, but you you don't have anything to do, and so I, I would. Uh, read regulations in the army uh, just for fun yeah just to stay awake <laughs> and one of them in there it said something about you could get early release for teaching or going to school uh, you know because you had to get out a certain time to teach and go to school and i got to figure it out you know and, uh, when when my time was up my two years was up at that time you had to serve two years as an officer. Today you have to serve six years. But anyway, uh, uh, that really struck it. You know, I thought, man, I can get out, I believe it's, uh, oh, it's 30 days or six weeks early. I thought anything to get out of here. And so I started uh, making contacts back here to about teaching jobs and teaching jobs were too plentiful and so I, I threw out hooks in Missouri and Kansas and Oklahoma to trying to land a job. Well we, we found a couple here in Kansas and I, I did well we uh, found one in Missouri but found out that uh, as soon as they found out that I didn't graduate from University of Missouri, they weren't interested in me. Hmm. Uh, they, they said, oh, we don't have much. So I come on back and interviewed uh, at, at one or two here, and then we, we still had some time. So I was down in Oklahoma, so I went in to, to the uh, vocational office to see about teaching job in Oklahoma. Well, they, they found out we were originally from Kansas, but went to school in Oklahoma, so they weren't interested either. So we come back to Kansas, and uh, we, we spent a whole whole day messing around in Fort Scott. Uh, Fort Scott was open, uh, which is over in eastern Kansas. I liked the looks of it, liked the looks of the town and everything, but there was a guy, they, they was waiting on him to make up his mind. And he had some experience, plus he had his master's degree. And I was second in line. Well, this, this guy finally made up his mind. And so, so long. But there was a job in western Kansas open out by Dodge City, little town of Ford. Before that, we went out to Johnson and interviewed. Well, we, we was at, at Ford and I interviewed, and they offered me a contract, because here it was in August, and school was going to start in September. So they were hungry for anybody. And so they offered me this job, but, but then also Johnson was opened up, 
that is in the far west, not right next to Colorado. Mm. So we, we went out there, uh, we had a contract in my pocket, and we was hoping somebody would offer me a little more money, but they didn't. First question they ask if you were Catholic. If you were, that was the end of the interview. Yep. But we were. They so wouldn't that, hire a Catholic. <laughs> wow. But that was just and, a different uh, time. <laughs> they, they didn't have a, an agriculture department in Johnson, but they wanted to start one. They said, we'll just give you a check. to You can buy anything you want to start out. Then also I said, uh, you'll be assistant football coach. I said, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. First football guy I ever went to in my life when I was a freshman in college. I don't know anything about football. Oh, that's all right. You'll make it okay. <laughs> well, in the meantime, the, the home ec teacher found out we were in the building, and she happened to be a classmate of Maryland's and had home ec at Oklahoma and now. So she come by and caught me and said, is Maryland here? Yeah, she's out there in the car. So she sh shot out the car, visited with her, and she said, are you applying for a job here? Yeah, or I was. She says, you get tell him to get in the car and get out of town as quick as he can. <laughs> I don't remember that. Well, yeah, she said that. The, the superintendent was, he, he was almost nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, they, they didn't offer me a job. Well, I, I had I wanted to have something written, and so I, I went back and took the job at Ford, and then uh, we went on back to South Carolina to finish getting out. And we went up to the door, uh, our door of our house. The phone was ringing, and I got to the phone, and it was Johnson offering me a contract. No, no, we we took the job at Ford, but that was fine because. It, it only lasted three or four years, and then it died out there. Mm. But, but we liked Ford. It turned out to we, we were Ford for three years, but it, it was small and declining, and it was consolidating. And, uh, we thought we better look for something. I more think substantial. people in western Kansas, at least at that point, were more progressive probably than back in this part of the world. But you thought nothing of hopping in the car and going into Dodge City to get a loaf of bread. <laughs> <laughs> Distance really didn't mean anything better. Well, how did you get to Peabody, Kansas? <laughs> well, that that's... Actually, uh, the place out at Ford that we were, they were going to close just yeah, they, they, any day, you know. Well, we we <laughs> ended up looking for a job out there. We were out there three years, and you could see consolidation coming. Mm. And so I looked for a job every year for three years. But it didn't come, actually, for another ten. You know, but anyway, I was in Ag Teachers Conference at, in Manhattan in the summertime. Uh, that's, they have it in Oklahoma, too. Uh, so all the Ag Teachers were in Manhattan for their summer conference. And I, I was eating supper in this uh, little old restaurant down there close to the hotel. And here come all the state supervisors, including the director come over to me. I was sitting up there having supper. I thought, what is going on? You know? And they knew that I was looking for a job. They said, would you be interested in going to Peabody? I said, Peabody? Where in the world is that? I had to come home and look it up on a map to find out where it was at. And they, they said, they have an opening. The, uh, their instructor See, this was in uh, June, and about all the teaching contracts are over by June. But anyway, th this instructor had got a state job late, and said it, it's opening up. It's uh, they got a relatively new building, and it said if if you want the job, we'll kind of hold out the ones that we send down there. Uh, and see if you like it. So uh, uh, the, the Ford music teacher had driven up there. He had his car there, so I didn't have a car because I, I had ridden with the, the Dodge City Ag teacher. And so I, I went over and talked to this music teacher. I said, could I borrow your car to go down to Peabody? Sure. 
so I, I flew down here and and the, and they'd setting up an interview and so I interviewed and they, they were ready to grab me because there wasn't anybody else out there. They said, you've got to be here on the 1st of July when your contract starts. Well, I, I had moved, well, I, I had to call, I called Marilyn to see if she was in, in, interested. We hadn't disposed of what we had out there. I'd, I'd had a tractor and some stuff that I'd accumulated and stuff that we couldn't move. And I had to come early. I, I had to leave her and, and come here early to be here by the 1st of July because I had to be on the job. So I brought an army cot and I slept in my office in the ag building up there for about a week, uh, waiting to get things lined up. And this was the only house available, the only one. Oh, there was yeah. one north of town that had no water, and here we had had a new baby by that time. Did this place yeah. had just come on the market, and the, uh, the guy's dad had this farm right over here, and had he known it had been on the market, he'd have grabbed it in a minute because he, he wanted to get out here closer to because he went by every day going to work at, at his dad's. And we we ended up buying this place. Had nine acres with it. And they, they cost wanted, nine thousand dollars. Yeah, they wanted to how we'd ever get it paid off. <laughs> that was you know, like Fort Knox, nine thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. We we sold everything we I sold my tractor and everything out there. Because I had to come up with two thousand dollars for down payment, and we finally got the two thousand dollars put together and bought this place. The rest is history, I guess. Hmm. <laughs> so you spent thirty-three years working for the school here. Yes, yes. Uh, that's almost unheard of anymore, because teachers come and go. You know, two or three years and they're gone down the road. In fact. Uh, I, I retired in 1993. Your turn. I retired in 1993, and they—they've had two, three, four. They're on their fifth egg teacher in, since '93. Wow. They go through them like we've had a. Well, last year we got an Oki in here, and he was real good. And I thought, well, well. Uh, I retired in 93 and some of my teachers got me by the ear and said, that for me or not? Wrong number, right? Anyway, some of my teacher friends said, why don't you run for the school board now that you're not teaching? See how it's like. Because there was an opening. And I, I stalled them off for a year or two and then come up for election. I, I run for election for the school board and got on it. I found out you have to die then to get off there. <laughs> but uh, so I, I was on school board then. But we've gone through like five egg teachers since I retired. Mm -hmm. We've got a new, new one this year. <laughs> but it seemed like teachers don't stay like they used to, mm -hmm. regardless who they are. At least in, in agriculture. Grade school teachers tend to stay a long well, time. Well, they, they stay forever. Uh, but high school teachers, they, they're more involved all the time. Well, with your, your finger on the pulse of agriculture, are you doing anything interesting here? Are you raising anything interesting? Well, we've, we've raised uh, sheep uh, almost all the time we've been here. We used to have as many as 250 till he retired and found out how much work it was, because I have always farmed. <laughs> and then we cut down the flock a lot. <laughs> and this year we cut it due to the weather and old age, I guess. But she cut it way back, we don't have any feed, we don't have any pasture. Gary was sick last winter, old winter, and so we just cut down the sheer number. Then we added goats over the years, actually was started in to provide milk for the orphan lambs and then we kind of like goats really well that works out pretty well for us and we've always guarded and we had a greenhouse out in western Kansas. Yeah, and we just moved, a small moved the greenhouse back here and so I've always had a greenhouse business. That was her occupation because she she never did teach she 
Uh, well, we had a, a daughter born when it was at four of them. So then we had two youngsters. I've she, always liked the idea if I had to go back, but I'd frankly rather mow yards than be shut in the house <laughs> and have to teach. But <clears throat> she she fell off pretty good. Uh, the, uh, she would raise bedding plants and this kind of stuff. Peabody had no greenhouse. Mm, made corsages for the and they, high school things. Uh, <clears throat> the business picked up pretty well. I mean, it kept growing every year. In fact, uh, there for a while, she done floor culture work too, uh, making corsages for prom and that kind of stuff. Then somewhere along the line, I learned to spin because we had a lady here, she's not here, but in Hillsboro, that Hillsboro had a lot of German people that came and settled in this area because of the railroad and that was something they did at home. So. We had all this wool, and well, she showed me how to spin. So then, for like 25 years, I taught spinning and dyeing here at the farm, and that was a lot of fun. People would come and stay here for a week. <clears throat> and then we developed a bed and breakfast across the field over there, and that was about the time. And that's not a lot of work. Well, no, it, we, <laughs> keep we, you off the streets. <laughs> <laughs> but it took care of. Uh, we needed water down there for the sheep, and so it paid the you know for the water bill to have that old house down there. Well, that worked out pretty well. Well, they, way back when she was teaching spinning, she would like the different fibers, mm -hmm. and so we started collecting breeds of sheep as a hobby. Hmm. And at one time we had twenty three different breeds of sheep here, uh, just because. You know, she liked this breed and this. And then, then we got uh, started developing black sheep because black sheep are res is recessive to white sheep. And it's a challenge to get them to turn black, to get them to turn coal black. Uh, you can get some black ones that they'd have white spots on them. Well, that didn't count. And so uh, we. We got them, got them where we could get them coal black, and we, we ran an ad or two in National Magazine, uh, long wool black sheep. Well, see, no, nobody was pushing black sheep. That was a no-no. Uh, but we, we, we went ahead and done that and got them where we could reproduce them about 95% of the time. The, 5 the other 5 percent they they come up with a white spot on top of their head, and the tip of their tail would be white. Well, the tail would be no problem because we always you could cut their tails off, but they still had the white spot on their top of their head. But anyway, we we would take a a pickup load of two ewe lambs and a one ram lamb. That that was the package. Uh, we would load it. Uh, we, we'd have during the winter. We we'd correspond and, and sell them to people back east and we would deliver these black sheep back east. We'd done that for five or six years till I got tired of going down I-70. <laughs> uh, and we, we delivered them as far as Bangor, Maine. Uh, we, we sent some to Aruba one year. We'll never do that again. But uh, we, we've got them. And also we've had uh, buyers here from Bakersfield, California that bought black sheep. But we sold black sheep then for all the time the, the spinning craze was going on, but then it it sort of took its course. We had the Main Street program, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but to revitalize little towns in America and it came to town. We, we in got very involved. 87 yeah. and so we got busy helping with that and that was the last year we taught spinning. But we met a lot of wonderful people that were interested. They would come and sometimes they would camp around, you know, pitch a tent around here, but usually they stayed someplace else. We, we've had people from all over the world took spinning, <laughs> including well, one, one doctor from Dodge City that came here every year for 20 something years. Mm -hmm. He'd come every year. He wouldn't learn anything. He'd just come to get away from his practice. <laughs> then about how long have we been traveling? 15 years, 20 years. I watched my folks. They were always going to go take a trip. And they never did. They died. 
my, my folks are about the same way. So we said, that's not going to happen. So then we started going on a trip. And, and because we have livestock, you can't go off and just right. leave them. You, so we, we had different people early on. And then for the past 10 or 12 years, we've had a good friend that worked for Gary when we had a store downtown. And she just moves out here and takes care of things. But we try and get it down to where it's the least amount of work possible, which is September and October for us. And so... You go everywhere? Do you go out of the country? Go out oh, of yeah. the country, you know. We, we've traveled quite a I, bit. I, I've been in all 50 states. And some people think we're absolutely crazy, but that's the way we spend <laughs> that, that, a bit. That's our hobby, I mean. Uh, last uh, year we went to Ireland. But we've gone to Switzerland and Italy and... Iceland. Guernsey Island. You ever been to Guernsey Island? Quite I have few, not. Quite a few places. Well, I, I, I always wanted to go to Guernsey Island because that's the home of the Guernsey cattle. Hmm. And I, I've known about it. And also, next to Guernsey Island is Jersey Island, where the Jerseys come from. Then it just happened these people came to town from Wichita, and he was from the Guernsey Isles, and they turned out to be good friends yeah. now, and they helped us go, and... They were Visit there. his folks and change currency and oh they're wonderful. They <laughs> just happen so. Well, uh, about the time I was getting ready to retire for up here, I bought this old derelict building downtown. There's a lot of them down there, but I bought it for what fifteen hundred dollars. Not very much. <laughs> and and we rebuilt it and started an antique store. So I had an antique store in there for twenty years. Uh, just because I like old stuff. But we knew nothing about running a business. Either. No. But anyway, this is where this couple come in, and I thought he had an English accent. I said, well, you must be from England. No, I'm from Guernsey. I said, ooh, we're getting ready to go to Guernsey. <laughs> Not at that point we hadn't. Uh, we wanted to go there, but we didn't know anything about it. And so they said, uh, they said well, we're going to this particular year that I talked about. He said, well, uh, I said, we're going to go at such and such time. He said, we're going to be there at that time vacationing too. So, we'll, And they met us at the airport, showed us around Guernsey. Now, Guernsey Island, you think you can't get lost on an island, but I've got the news. <laughs> when the, the Germans occupied that during World War II, and the native people didn't, you know, they didn't like them. And they took down all the street signs. And they never have got around to put them back up. Well, you can get lost. One time we spent four hours trying to find a place. And come to find out, it was just, just three three blocks from from where we stand. You just kind of go round and round. And <laughs> the streets, there's no rhyme or reason. The streets were real narrow, too. We got out there one time to show people, uh, it's going to take a picture of how narrow the streets were. We held our hands out like this. She was over there and I was over here. And we touched both sides of the road. And on the wall, uh, on the sides of the road, was rock wall. And with a rental car, you'd be real careful. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> You hit that rock wall and you pay dearly. And about, I don't know, 12 years ago, maybe? Let's see. She, okay. About that time. Gary has a cousin who's never married. She's a lab technician. I call her my old VA VA hospital in uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma now, but she spent a lot of years back in New York. And anyhow, we got the idea. She, she was actually born the same year we were married, so she's 61. But asked her if she'd like to travel with us. That's when we were going to Switzerland. She didn't have many. She never. Have. She's never. Uh, she has a sister, but as far as I know, she, she'd never traveled much before. But she wasn't really close to somebody else, you know. So anyhow, now she's kind of like our daughter. She takes care. She drives anymore and that sort of thing. But anyhow, we went to Switzerland. Well, that time she showed up with five suitcases. To her credit, she's <laughs> never done it again. But it was, oh, yeah. it was pretty dreadful. Because over here, she had to handle them all. She took care. I, I, but, I didn't handle them. But now, you know, she still takes more than I think she needs. She, she's down to one suitcase. <laughs> but anyhow, and then about the time, well, when she turned 50, I guess she can go to elder hospital stuff. So we found 
some things that sounded interesting in the other hostile classes. I don't know if you know anything about them, but it's a national organization. Mm -hmm. So you can go and they have everything arranged. It's usually through some local college. But, so we're going to go to one actually next week. Um, the yeah. end, end of Wisconsin, the Apostle Isles. Clear up around Lake Superior, and, far north as you can get. And somehow, Alda likes lighthouses, so there's some lighthouses. And I, I want to see a cranberry bog because I've never seen one. What else? But Plus, anyway. uh, take in the cheese factors, too. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so that's our biggie for this year. So that's not overseas. But we went to Ireland last year, and actually, we got so tired of sitting for so long. It was miserable, you know. On the, on the it was like airplane. Right. seven hours. Mm -hmm. They shove you in there like a bunch of hogs. Right. If you could ever afford to go first class, that might be better. I don't know. <laughs> so we we traveled quite a lot in recent years and met the nicest people. And people always say, you know, aren't you scared or rude? Or... Well, so, some and people. Dogs. I really love animals, dogs, and I've met the nicest dogs all around the world. That's always a conversation piece, no matter where you are. <laughs> so, some people spend all their time and money like bowling or, mm -hmm. or golf. Right. Ours is traveling. Uh, generally, we go, we go in September, crowding the 1st of October for several reasons. One of them is... We told her about that. Oh, oh the little kids are at school. And it's cooler. And, and so we, we always go about that, and it, it's worked out pretty well. And we, we've gone all over. We don't ever go any place that's hot. <laughs> that's a smart thing to do. Well, oh, we, this past two years have been horrible. <laughs> we, we did take off and go to Chile once. <laughs> but that was in the winter. That was our That really, was in uh, first of December. That <laughs> was a mistake on our part, which we never thought of, because the same gal came out and took care of things. But we didn't think about things freezing up here, mm -hmm. like the hoses freezing up. I never thought to tell her to drain the hoses. Or, of course, then she had to do a lot more work outside because things froze, and that was... We'll never do that again, but that was our own stupidity. But, it, that was, but it was nice summer, for us to travel because summer of the Chile, changes you know, reversed there. But. And Chile, we're going to see a lot more of Chile uh, producing our fruits and vegetables for us. Mm -hmm. Because in California, are making condos and fruit farms. <laughs> right. Well, you, you mentioned you bought a... a old building downtown and in the directions coming here today I noticed that your daughter put on the directions that y'all were pretty active in getting uh, some of the buildings downtown uh, on the register, National yeah, Register. She, she done that. Yeah, the Historical Society. Actually I don't know how I got particularly started in it, except they asked me to plant the planters up town in front of the museum and, and the kids were little. I really didn't do that much in it you know, in the first few years, but since then I've done a lot with it and so, some of these put up old, stuff for people, that sort of thing. Some of these old buildings had gotten in pretty bad shape. And I, uh, I was teaching at the time and the band teacher had become the real estate person in town as his part-time job. And did this, he got a hold of this old building, uh, one of many old buildings down there. He said, how about selling this building, Jones? Said, it, it's a bargain. I said, uh, not for me. And so uh, they, they had bought it to keep, there was a junk dealer wanted to buy it to just put junk in. But anyway, I, in one of my weaker moments, I went down with him to look at it, and I, I visualized, you know, what you could do with it. I had, we had no idea what we was going to do with it at the time, but for fifteen hundred dollars, you know, that, that's what it could buy the bits. The stone building, nice building, two-story building. So I bought the thing, and so I went down to survey what I bought. Went in there right after a rainstorm and. There was 52 five-gallon buckets under drips. <laughs> the, the, the ceiling just leaked like a sieve, you know. There was this much water on the floor. I thought, oh boy. 
So the first thing we done was was hire a roofer for six thousand dollars to put a roof on the thing, and he tore the thing clear off. But I knew we had to get it stabilized before I could do anything, and we did. And then then we uh, started painting. It hadn't been painted for years. There's an old grocery store, uh, and they they used to slaughter in the back room uh, for this meat market. It was a beer joint too. Uh -huh. And so anyway we, we started dunging it out, painting, and uh, got where I was painting the walls one time and putting it on just pretty heavy. And I, I'd worked under of an evening after I was still teaching school at that time. And I, I'd come home and it wasn't how much you got painted, it was how much paint did you use up. If you didn't use up a gallon of paint, you just didn't do much. So, but anyway, we, we got that done and we decided to go into an antique business because I always like to go to farm auctions and this kind of stuff. I sort of specialized in old agriculture stuff and, and, and furniture went with it. And we run that antique store down there for for 20 years. But in 87, that was when the Main Street program came, and we did do a lot, and, and Main Street looked really good then for a while. And Every now, building now was full. Going back downhill now, but we had Baker Furniture here in town, and they had like 11 buildings downtown. Well, about three years ago now, they decided, the big problem was Highway 50 went, decided to go around, or the State Department of Transportation mm -hmm. sent Highway 50 around instead of going through the north side of town. It's much more convenient for traffic, but it was a killer as far as the town was concerned. So there went all the traffic that we had worked hard to get downtown. Mm -hmm. And it literally you know, killed the town. Well, then when Baker decided to move out and move to Newton, now we've got empty buildings again, and lots of them. And and he didn't take very good care of the building. So now now the Main Street, we still have the Main Street problem, or we wouldn't be here at all, but they have purchased buildings and they're trying to get rooms back on and get attract some businesses to come in, but you know, who really wants to come in? The economy is not too great. Right, what are you going to bring in that yeah. can survive here? And it's easy to run the Newton, uh, my pet peeves, people that run the Dillons or wherever it takes to get their groceries and don't support their local local businesses. But I, I need to back up when I, I was teaching that, you know, they always encourage you to go get your master's. That's, and also you, you looked at the salary schedule and that's the only way you could get a decent raise was to get your master's. So, so I started going to K-State in the summertime to get my master's. And I spent six summers taking classes up there. And uh, of course, then, then they, they used to rag me all the time being an Oklahoma graduate. Mm -hmm. And they, they kept saying, why don't you wear a K-State hat? I don't want to wear those things. <laughs> and, <laughs> because a lot of the teachers were K-State graduates. But I, I said, well, yeah, I, I, I graduated K-State and Oklahoma State too, so I got dual allegiance. Well, we, uh... I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, one year he went to uh, to Illinois to work on his master's one summer and the music teacher and I built that barn out there that summer. I'm gonna take you out there pretty soon. We uh we notice graduates from from Oklahoma State, Oklahoma A and M have this intense loyalty to their school. It's like nothing I've ever seen and I'm from Florida and it's 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 like nothing I've seen. You're not a gator. Oh no, I am not a gator. No no no. I'm a Seminole. That's a bad word. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, that, that, we were we were with Oklahoma and M they they said, oh, are you from OU? No. I wouldn't, wouldn't. That was a bad word. <laughs> we, we just call that the junior college down south. Why why do you think that Oklahoma State graduates have this loyalty towards I don't know. towards the school down there. I don't know, but I've noticed the same thing. It's much more intense than most most places. I well, in, now in Kansas, the same things with K State. Mm -hmm. They're they're really loyal. With, I know we got a principal up here. I, I always used to accuse him having purple shorts because uh, he, he was so loyal to, to K State. I think K State and KU are, but you don't hear it about the other 
No, Wich- you never Wichita State or Emporia. Emporia. State. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose they're smaller, too, so that probably makes a difference. The kids all have degrees from K-State. Yeah. And well, now the, 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 our daughter-in-law and our son-in-law graduated from there, too. In fact, Lynn has her master's from K-State. Our, our son is a... He graduated from vet school, which took him nine years to get through that thing. But he's he's been he's a practicing practicing veterinary medicine in northern Kansas. And then Lynn and her husband both both work now for Oklahoma State. They're not. Have teachers. you met Lynn actually? I have not. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I thought she said she really didn't know you. Mm-hmm. She works yeah. over in the fire protection. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then uh, our son-in-law does nothing but lay cart carpet all over the campus. Hmm. He's a carpet layer. But he actually has a degree in hotel and restaurant administration. Yeah, from, so. from Kansas State. And so they're, they're still, uh, he, he's an avid K-State fan. You know. I don't know if this is of any interest to you in the slightest, but I did dig out. Oh, your old Redskins. Under the bed, you know. <laughs> uh, Been under there forever. Lynn, it, was, it was pretty bad, it probably still is, but anyhow, I dug that out and Lynn found our picture. But that era, and I don't think, you, I think she said they don't even put these out anymore. They do not. Okay. Well, when we were there, if you didn't pay to get in it, you didn't get in it. Yeah. And so the lady I worked for if paid. If you didn't, didn't buy a book. Paid to get us in there. So that's the only reason that we're in there at huh. all. Anyway. Well, do you have any, as we wind down, any memories about your time in college that are just real special to you? Oh, not not particular. Get we it. got through it. Got through it. And it's a good thing. So and at that point, I don't know that anybody from Dexter High School ever went to college. They did afterward. But yeah, I don't there know was a few of them after before. later, but nobody green out of everybody high thought school. we were absolutely crazy. Of course, I, I look back at Dexter. It's kind of economic deprived area. Mm-hmm. It yeah. probably was at the time, but we didn't know it. No, we, we didn't know, know it. That's didn't typical know it. of the time. We yeah. were all poor. We didn't know it. Oh, that's right. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, and as far as the vet village part, I think now if it had been bigger, more to take care of, you couldn't have, you wouldn't have managed it. We couldn't have afforded it. Now, our, our, our son got married when he got into vet school, and they lived in the married apartments up there. They are... They're plush. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Times have Compared, changed. Well, they're not. They're no, plush I, now, yeah. but they were. That, but they were much better than ours. Much, much better than this, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But th- this is all they had. Mm-hmm. For a long time, there was one of these left over at Newton. Yeah, it's they, not they, there anymore. But I, I tried to buy one one time, and, it, uh, and I just just for you know keeps it. But they wanted a fortune for the thing. But Lynn and I were just talking, particularly me, the older you get, the smaller I like the house to be. <laughs> and I can't remember the man's name, but he does a series on tiny houses. You know, they're, they're, they're really tiny, too. And we don't really need all this stuff around here, that's for sure. But, and we certainly didn't have it here. But. I, I don't want you to see the, that. That's the layout of the house. Well, it simply had one door at the front, which you could see on here. It had these windows, and they cranked out from the bottom and cranked out sideways. Yeah, t- today, they, you'd have to have two doors on the kind of fire. I wonder how they named the streets. Well, Rudy said was French, but don't yeah. ask. <laughs> what does that mean, if you, you speak French? <laughs> no idea, but, it, you know, it's something to look into. I, I think maybe, see, being Best Village, and I suspect at one said. time, the the vets had a hand in maybe naming the streets. Excuse me a second, I'll call our local veterinarian to open up the degree in French. I got a feeling maybe they had a, a hand in naming the streets. Because mm-hmm. they were from all over. Hmm. And we, we, we got in on the tail end of the veterans coming in. Right. And they, they were taking any married students that come in. Were they starting to dismantle the housing units while you were still there? Yeah, they, they had moved. There were some areas that were just vacant. Mm-hmm. And there were some, there, all that was there was the foundations. Were, well, they didn't, these these houses didn't have a foundation. They had four poles set in the ground. Mm-hmm. And that was the foundation. And then they had a concrete floor in the house. And then they 
later on they uh, when they they blacked off the streets the the streets were blacked off when we went there but and reading history they were mud streets for years but uh, they blacked off and then they made a concrete walk up here with a stick now ours had we had a a small picket fence about this tall around here, especially when we had our bulldog, because that way you could let them out. Bulldogs couldn't jump over that little low fence. <laughs> and so, our, in fact, somebody stole one of our bulldog pups one time. Really? Yeah. That, that's when I was uh, in an ROTC camp in Benning in the summertime. Uh, our old bulldog had two pups. One of them was a nice pup, the other one he was well, much good. But they sold a good one. So She didn't know. She said it means the street of, with whatever issue D. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I'll just have to you ask have to. our campus historian. Yeah. And it's D-U-S-U-D. It's D-E-S-U-D. Yeah. Seven well, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close her on out today? Anything we, else you'd like to share? Tell me about run through, <laughs> through the game. I think I've covered it from A to Z. <laughs>